This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to this week's Killer Innovation Show. We're all about ideas, creativity, and innovations, and where we introduce you to top innovators who share with you their story so that you can take your ideas and change the world. If you're listening live, join the conversation by tweeting your questions and comments using the hashtag KILive. Today, with the audio probably sounds a little bit different. We're, we're actually broadcasting live from the Unreasonable Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I've been mentoring at Unreasonable since 2011, and with me today is Daniel Epstein, who is the founder of Unreasonable, and who somehow hoodwinked me or talked me into coming to Boulder in 2011. So, hey, Daniel, for our listeners, give us the 60-second radio commercial for Unreasonable. Yeah, our, our goal at Unreasonable is to put a dent on global poverty. And our belief is that the best bet we can hedge in that regard is to bet on entrepreneurs on the front lines solving problems related to poverty with scalable models. And you, you'll hear from a couple of them today. I think that in the 60-second explanation, though, it's always important to rationalize a seemingly irrational name, which is Unreasonable. And that's inspired by uh, George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, who said the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adapting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. And we think if George Bernard Shaw is right, if progress depends on the reasonable person, then in a world where over a billion people live in absolute poverty, we can't afford not to bet on reasonable people and who's more unreasonable than entrepreneurs themselves. <laughs> the crazy bunch. Absolutely. So you're a co-founder though, right? So yep. tell us a little bit about your, the other founders and how you guys all got together to do yeah, this totally. kind of crazy effort. Totally, totally. You know, there, there's a saying, uh, and it's don't do business with friends. I, <laughs> yeah, it could be dangerous. It's like also almost like doing business with your spouse. Right? Exactly. Well, my, my take on it is I, I, I disagree. I actually think you should only do business, if you can, with best friends. And that's how this all started. It was a bunch of friends sitting around who you know, we felt like misfits, and we wanted to seek refuge amongst fellow misfits, i.e. entrepreneurs hungry to put a dent on history. That's positive. I, and so we, we came together in university and uh, forged what later became the Unreasonable Institute. But really, as a group of friends who you know were as scrappy as you could possibly be, nobody took a salary in the you know first even couple of years of the effort, um, and we were able to forge this yeah, out of friendship and out of a shared belief uh, to participate in something like this. So what was the spark? I mean, yeah. you have this natural entrepreneurial bent. Yeah. I know your other founders. Yeah. You know, you know, most people want to either you know, go off and start a tech company, write an app. Totally. But in this case, it's a little you got, different. You, this is different. So, <laughs> what was the spark? What was the thing that just yeah. got you into that mode of what I call you can't not do? Yeah, you guys totally. are just driven to do this. What was it that really pulled you into this? So, the interesting thing for me is there's no particular moment. There's no romantic aha story or moment. And it was, a, it was more a series of events, but my freshman year in university, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and it was awkward because I said I wanted to do Starbucks, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was basically, I was asking myself the wrong question though, which is what do I want to do? You know, is it going to be an app? Is it going to be e-commerce? Is it going to be brick and mortar? And I remember journaling one night and I wrote out that as entrepreneurs, we design solutions to problem sets. And I wrote on the next line, I can choose what problem sets I want to solve. And I wrote on the last line, I'm only going to solve problem sets worthy of my life's work. You know, I, I don't care if I'm 18 years old or not. And that took me down this path when I realized that you could. And I think the moment that you realize that you can create solutions that can change the lives for millions of people in a meaningful way, there's nothing that can stop that. And so that inertia has carried me to where I am today. You know, my, my parents are concerned probably. I wouldn't say it's passion. I would say it's obsession. Um, are and, they uh, still asking you to get like a real job? It, well, no, actually, they're asking me to get a girlfriend, which is what we were talking about before this because it's been eight years since I started Unreasonable and started working on are you it. you like a typical entrepreneur, though. You're, you're married to the company. Totally right. right. Totally right. Totally right. And, you know, I used to believe that uh, life and work, those are almost mutually exclusive, and, and I've learned that actually if you blend those two things together, they both become much richer. But. Well, as, as a mentor, I have to say I've been impressed since I got involved in 2011 when I was still at HP with, one, the quality of the companies mm -hmm. you select to be part of the institute, which, you know, when I try to describe it to other people as to why exactly. I'm involved with Unreasonable, and I think about it as really a social innovation incubator or a social innovation accelerator yeah, to help absolutely. these entrepreneurs uh, be successful. 
But you've also gone from a change a little bit because the yeah. early companies, a number of them were nonprofits. Yeah. In later years now, it's totally. the Unreasonable is really focused on you yeah. can do social good yeah. as a for-profit business. 100%. 100%. It gets back to the idea. As entrepreneurs, we design solutions to problem sets. You can choose what problem sets you want to work on. And I'd say if you're going to leverage your time, your sweat, your equity, your relationships, your sleep into something, why not work on a problem worth caring life. about? Right? I mean, everything. Right. Everything, yes. as you know. Completely everything. And I would say that we have realized that you know, if we care about ending or at least put in a significant dent on issues like global poverty, then you have to think about scale. When you think about scale, you have to think about profit. And in reality, I hope that the companies you work with become billion-dollar companies. And it doesn't have to do with the money itself. It speaks to the scale at which they're solving the problems. Right. And your objective is is you look for companies that are- that do have a problem that can scale. Yep. Right. As the criteria for the selecting of the companies Absolutely. that apply. Absolutely. And so every year you bring these just as crazy entrepreneurs to totally. Boulder, Colorado, and then put totally. them through the meat grinder yeah. for six weeks. Yeah. Um, but it's an incredible experience. But one of the key components are the mentors. Now, yeah. I'm not talking about me, but I mean, totally. when I when I come here, I meet people that I'm like, man, I, I like having the fact that I meet him and he's totally. part of my network. Totally. But how do you, you know... Well, how do we you, hoodwink you, you? you? You are like the most outrageous person. You will call and talk to anybody yeah, totally. to ask them to be part of Unreasonable. Totally. So how do you go about getting how do you get the them? mentors? Yeah. You know, our, our first Unreasonable Institute was, it was, it was summer of 2010, and we had 50 mentors show up and probably asked about 60. So that was a huge hit rate, very like unusually successful because we had no reputation and, and no permission and no right to be doing this. And I think it comes down to something that we select for in the companies we work with, which is a paradoxical blend of confidence and humility, right? You have confidence in the noteworthiness of what you're trying to do, but enough humility to admit that the greatness of what you're going to achieve is going to be through your teams and so on and so forth. And so what I would do is I realize that most of the world doesn't reach out to these people, whether whether it's yourself or it's co-founders of Facebook or Google or Twitter, most people don't reach out to them because they don't think they're ever going to respond. But in reality, they do, right? You just have to reach out. So that's step number one. And then I'd ask for a 10-minute phone call. We'd jump on the phone and you know, would basically say, look, what we're doing is a huge experiment. We don't know if it's going to succeed. But what we do know is that we believe there's no experiment more noteworthy of our time than this one. And we are positive it will fail unless we get mentors like you to show up. So will you join us, right? And so you have confidence in the experiment, but you're humble enough to admit that it will fail without them. And I think people want to be a part of things that could be historic. Well, that's it. Everybody wants to be part of something that's going to have a broader impact than just the normal for-profit businesses. Totally. Totally. And, and you can have both, right? Exactly. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, you know, and kudos to you, you know, with, with your, uh, your at sea experiment. Yeah. You took everybody and stuffed them on a boat. And I do apologize. I was supposed to be on the we'll boat. Do it again. But I got distracted <laughs> um, with a new opportunity, with a new job, actually. Yeah. Uh, but you had like, you know, Desmond Tutu as a mentor yeah. on, on yeah. Unreasonable at Sea, where you took these entrepreneurs and took them around the world totally. to meet, you know, the totally. leading thinkers in different parts of the world to really open our eyes, totally. you know, um, both as the entrepreneurs totally. and as the, you know, to see something that's outside of just your normal. Nine to five kind of existence that we have today. Yeah, you know, I think that I mo- most people would look at that and say that it was impossible. And before we did it, we thought it was impossible. The idea was how do we help these entrepreneurs in emerging markets scale into new international markets? If they're effectively solving a problem at a national scale right now, how do we take them cross continentally and, in, and into new countries as well? And we have a belief that empathy builds empires. The only way to go to market is to go. And so if we were going to experiment in helping a technology company scale into new markets, we'd have to go there. And so one thing led to another. We said we needed to do it. And somehow we ended up in a situation where we commandeered a wing of a ship and partnered with Stanford's D school and uh, an organization called Semester at Sea. And sailed around the world with these companies. And yeah, the mentors were unbelievable. We had Archbishop Desmond Tutu for 11 weeks, sailed and lived with us and the entrepreneurs and mentored them. We had the Prince of Saudi Arabia, not because he's a prince, but because he brought Facebook into uh, Arabia. He was head of U.S. Arab operations. We had the founder of WordPress. 22% of the internet is run on WordPress now. He joined us. You know, It was an unbelievable group of basically these misfit technologists and entrepreneurs trying to solve the hardest problems. So should I take that as an insult? I'm a misfit technologist. No, you should take that as a compliment. So if someone wants to follow up and keep track of what's going on with Unreasonable, where can they find you? 
Yeah. Uh, online, in terms of social media, it's just facebook.com slash unreasonable. Our Twitter handle is just unreasonable. Um, the website that shows all of our projects is unreasonablegroup.com, and where we're at right now is unreasonableinstitute.org. Perfect. Hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you spending the time. Uh, of course. Coming up after this, we're going to actually bring in a couple of those uh, these entrepreneurs to us that are here at the Institute this year to tell their stories so you can hear just a couple of them and yeah. hear really the great impact activities they got going on. So stay right where you're at. You don't want to miss this. I'm Phil McKinney, and this is Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Talk Radio. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game changing killer innovation. As we learned in segment one, companies in the Unreasonable Institute are working on ideas to truly change the world, to be for-profit, social innovation companies, literally looking at how do you attack the big challenges that we have on a global scale. And the founders saw a problem, and they're singularly focused on the problem that they're going after. I'm Phil McKinney, and you're listening to Killer Innovations. If you're listening live, just don't sit there, participate. Join us via Twitter using the hashtag KILive. So in this segment, we're actually going to talk to one of the companies. Uh, they had their Launchpad event on Friday where all the uh, the founders made their uh, told their stories in a big event here in Boulder. I got to listen to it. And uh, we're going to listen to two of them. But right now, we're going to have one of those founders share the story. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? All right, thank you for having me. My name is Gavin Armstrong, and I'm the founder and president of Lucky Iron Fish. L- I, t- I have to tell you something. When I heard the title and the name of your company on Friday night, I had no idea where your pitch was going to go. So give us the 60-second kind of radio commercial. What is Lucky Iron Fish? So iron deficiency is the world's most common micronutrient issue. It negatively impacts the lives of 3.5 billion people. Hold it. Billion. Billion. Half of the world's population. And iron deficiency rates have increased uh, since the year 2000 by 10%. So current treatments simply are not working. So we have developed a simple technology, the Lucky Iron Fish, that's going to change that. So what the Lucky Iron Fish is, it's a, it's a simple iron ingot that you cook with it. If you cook with it for just 10 minutes, if you're boiling your water or making soup, it can release up to 90% of your daily required iron intake. One fish is reusable and can last for over five years. So, okay. How did you get into, one, focusing on the problem of iron deficiency? So where was that spark? What was the thing you saw that got you all excited about this? Well, what got me really excited is um, knowing that iron deficiency is a global problem, complex problem. The World Bank estimates it has a $70 billion loss on the global economy every year. It impacts half of the world's hold population. Hold on. $70 billion annually Annually. loss because of iron deficiency. Loss of income in households, loss of ability to participate in the workforce, and loss of uh, cognitive development in children. Holy smokes. So, so you identify the problem as being, but look, we all take supplements, right? We, you know, the big thing, big market here in the U.S. Right. is, you know, multivitamins that, that you take, you take your iron as part of that. Doesn't that solve the problem? So um, it's very easy to rely on being a, a pill popping culture. Uh, iron supplements not only are expensive, but because of their negative side effects, um, they actually have a compliance rate of about 33% in Cambodia. We're lucky iron fish because we don't have any side effects and because it's so simple to use, has a compliance rate of 92 percent wow so you're starting off right now in cambodia yeah right so what's the, but, but your solution plays out globally i mean even in the u.s someone could throw it into their pot and would, and it would work perfectly absolutely iron deficiency does not discriminate between the developed and developing world uh, an estimated 10 uh, percent of americans have iron deficiency 20 percent of women who have just given birth in the u.s have iron deficiency so it's a problem here as well wow we're moving the iron uh, fish to be on, in retail markets here in the u.s we s- currently sell it online on our website at luckyironfish.com and if you buy one for yourself we actually give one away for free to an ngo network in cambodia really so if you so if if an american buys that product from your website lucky iron fish 
you then will do one for one. They get their fish, and then they make, you make one available for someone in Cambodia. We do, and that's not going to be our end model. I think there are better ways that we can invest in improving the health of people around the world who need it. But right now, this is, uh, this is the way we're doing that. Wow, that's amazing. So Friday night, I heard, your, I heard you tell your, your story when you had to fit your entire story into five minutes on stage here at the... Uh, at the, the launch pad event Friday night here in Boulder. Five minutes and 10 seconds. Five minutes and 10 seconds. So they give you 10 seconds for the intro piece, right? Yeah. Um, but you told the story or a little bit about how you actually got it to be shaped like a fish and what, where you started at originally. So talk me through that again. I, I think that's a, it's a fascinating story. Yeah, so the, the original concept was invented by a student, Christopher Charles, from the University of Guelph, and he came up with the idea of cooking with cast iron and boiling water. And though this was scientifically effective, nobody wanted to do it. It, it made no sense to put an ugly piece of metal into your cooking pot. But after some research, he discovered that the symbol of a fish is a symbol of luck in Cambodia. So he actually shaped that piece of iron like a fish, called it the happy fish, and that's when we saw the really high compliance rates. <laughs> so no change in what I would call product functionality it is purely from the standpoint of the psychological effect of do I drop a, a block of iron into my pot or do I drop this fish into the pot? Yep, and then uh, when we, what we saw in the trials was people put it in because they wanted their households to be lucky, and then when they started feeling better, they were saying, oh, it works, it actually is it's lucky, and my kids are doing better in school, I'm not passing out anymore, uh, and so they, they believe in the luck. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so what were some of the challenges you had getting, getting this thing started and, and actually getting it to where it is today? Um, I mean, that's typical, um, I think, um, a founder of an, entrep- uh, of an activity. It's trying to understand the market. So I was very arrogant, thinking, this is such an amazing idea. Everybody's going to want it. I'm going to sell it door-to-door, and, and we'll be fine. Um, to be sustainable, we had to sell around 200 a month. And in six months, we sold about three. Uh, so <laughs> wow. uh, but the sales model did not work. And so I uh, had to take a step back, learn from that mistake, and understand how uh, current individuals get their iron supplementation and how I can actually go into existing networks and not try and reinvent the wheel. So, so what was that pivot then? It was really about just trying to find the way to actually make it attractive to, to, the, to your target population well, you're trying to help. But why, why would we want to compete with NGOs who are providing health uh, fortification programs? Why not work with them? Right. They're spending mil- hundreds of millions of dollars on iron supplement pills. So why not say this is a cheaper, more uh, sustainable solution? Why don't you provide this on your networks instead? So working together is how we're getting the fish into the pots of those who need it. And I'm going to guess that you probably had what I refer to as some innovation antibodies in the NGOs. You're coming in with such a simple solution, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're the experts. That's not going to work. Yeah, well, I'm not going to name names, but we've definitely, <laughs> oh, come on. We definitely still experienced that. Um, it's getting over the simplicity of our product is, is our biggest barrier. Um, cooking with iron is a concept that's been done since 500 BC. It's been around for centuries, and so we just need to tell people this works. The research is proven. Um, let's get it into the pots. Yeah, and, and, th- and I think that's the whole thing. A lot of people think of innovation has got to be this big complex. You've got to have all the feature sets. And, and uh, you know, complexity equals innovation. But in this case, the simplicity of this is what I found just so attractive to the idea when I heard it Friday night at the event about really something as simple as just cooking with iron into the food and letting and letting that iron um, be absorbed in and be consumed by the people. Yeah. So. Uh, if you want to follow what you're doing, how, how can they find you? So our website is simple, luckyironfish.com. Twitter and Facebook is just Lucky Iron Fish. And if, they want to, if someone wants to buy one, we ship around the world at luckyironfish.com. That's great. So what, really quick, give me one thing that's between you and success. It's, it's really identifying that simple, simple solutions can solve complex problems. Oh, that is fantastic. So, uh, so if you're listening, follow them and uh, get your lucky fish and uh, help somebody else also in the process of that purchasing. Uh, thanks for spending the time with us. Thank you. Uh, I don't know about you, but stories like that put everything in perspective. So I was a mentor to some of these companies, and there's 10 more here at the Institute, um, and there's more stories like this. So stay tuned. We actually have another founder that will be uh, telling their story, and when, when we come back, uh, we're going to have that uh, founder to share with us. I'm Phil McKinney, and this is Killer Innovations. Have you heard about BizTV? 
Biz TV is the home for America's entrepreneurs, small businesses, and those who want to succeed in life. It's the first national television network committed to airing original, high quality, educational, and inspirational programming about real business people. Small businesses drive America forward, generating 64% of all new jobs in the last decade. With over 30 million small businesses in the U.S., shouldn't you be watching Biz TV? With the right kind of ideas, motivation, and education to help fuel the next generation of business owners, Biz TV is the network you should be watching. Success stories, new ideas turned into businesses, programs full of sales tips, goal setting, how to manage, how to raise capital, and improving work-life balance. Biz TV is for those who want to succeed. Visit biztv.com and call your satellite or cable service provider to request Biz TV. Biz Talk Radio. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Companies in the Unreasonable Institute are working hard on ideas to change the world. And this is all about founders who solve problems and really become laser-focused on how to fix it. These... These are entrepreneurs in the purest sense and really go after some of these problems, which I think are just inspirational and ones that I think uh, can be inspiring to all entrepreneurs uh, out there. I'm Phil McKinney, and you're listening to Killer Innovations. If you're listening live, don't sit there. Participate. Join in. You can uh, uh, use the hashtag KILive, and uh, we'll start uh, looking at uh, the Twitter feed and taking those questions. So we've got another founder here, that uh, another one that uh, actually I was mentoring with last week and made his uh, presentation at the launch event in uh, Boulder on Friday night. And uh, I'll tell you, all of the entrepreneurs on Friday night at the Launchpad event just knocked it out of the park. There's you know 600 people in the audience, and uh, I think everybody just walks out every year out of that Launchpad event inspired about the fact that uh, in Entrepreneurs from around the world can identify those problems, and they can truly change the world. So I've got – I want to – this is a story that I – this next one that I really want you to listen to. I think there's a lot to learn from an inspiration standpoint, but also tackling uh, the big problem. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and let the, uh, the audience know a little bit about you. Thanks for having me here, Phil. I'm Rubat Khan from MDoc. I'm the founder and the CEO. And so, in your case, this is actually not your first entrepreneurial effort. You know, you're the proverbial serial <laughs> entrepreneur going out multiple times. So give us the 60-second radio commercial on what it is you're working on right now. So, uh, in Bangladesh, where I'm from, about 100 million people, uh, that's one-third of the population of the U.S., live without regular access to doctors. They live in really remote areas where uh, when they get ill or their uh, children are ill, uh, they don't really have a place to go to for care. And uh, that's uh, not just a problem in Bangladesh, but uh, it's a global problem. About 57 countries in the world face a chronic shortage of doctors. And uh, most of these doctors, even when they're present, they're present in the cities. And so in the rural areas, people are pretty much uh, do not have access to doctors when they need them. And um, uh, about a, one and a half billion people in the world actually have never seen a doctor in their lives. So, so that's the scale of the problem. And the way we're trying to solve it is by connecting uh, doctors with uh, pharmacists or other providers in the village who are already providing some sort of care, but we are empowering them with the technology so that they can connect uh, patients in their villages with doctors in the city and get a prescription uh, within a few minutes. So back to your statistic about the size and scale of the problem in Bangladesh. When you say people don't have access to medicine, what does that mean? Does it mean it's it's a 30-minute drive to get to finding a doctor? Or is it a two-hour drive to get to? What classifies someone as not really having access to medical care? So it actually varies. So uh, let me give you a picture. There might be there are many villages in Bangladesh where uh, the nearest road uh, network is at least uh, two hours walk away. 
And so you would, uh, in cases where there, there, those are hilly regions, it, it, it is even longer. So you have to make that hike to the nearest road network, and then if you're lucky, you would get a really, um, uh, like, a bus that is falling apart, um, and, like, through really risky road networks, you actually end up making a trip to the town. When you're in the town and you've uh, finally reached the clinic, unfortunately, the doctor isn't there because you didn't know when the doctor is supposed to be there uh, or the doctor that you need is not there. So uh, it's a really risky proposition. And then there are people who are exploiting um, these uh, un uneducated patients and basically exploiting them out of money. So uh, just one story that I can share, uh, a, a patient that I met once was uh, someone who lived on less than a dollar a day, and he had a broken leg from uh, just uh, working one day. And he spent over the next two years about two thousand dollars. Well, he makes a dollar a day. Makes, makes less than a dollar a day. So how do you? How does he pay a bill like that? He actually uh, sold his family land and tried to fix his leg, and he ended up not being able to fix it, and he was still crippled when we met him. So that, that, that is the scale of the problem that we have in, in a place like Bangladesh. So let's back up. What was the spark? What was that thing that just kind of turned on your light bulb and said, this is a problem, and I'm going to go after this? I think it's a it's a series of events, um, but one thing that really pops out at me, and uh, I've actually kind of realized it at the institute. Um, it didn't really occur to me as as that aha moment before, but um, I uh, back in about uh, six years ago, I was in a remote village of Bangladesh attending a cultural festival, and we decided to stay for the night. Um, around 2 a.m. in the morning, I woke up with uh, really bad stomach cramps uh, and had uh, continuous diarrhea and vomiting for the next five hours. Um, about three hours in, I, was, uh, I, I had pretty much resigned my life to fate, and um, I ended up, uh, I remember quite vaguely that I reached out for my phone and sent a text to my then fiancé saying, um, I don't know if I'll see you again. Wow. And uh, that was, I think, uh, the closest to death that I've ever been. And it, I was kind of lucky that I survived that night, but uh, many people aren't as lucky as I am. And in that case, how far away were you from medical care? Um, at least 100 miles from the nearest doctor. 100 miles from the nearest doctor. Wow. So, so how'd you get this? How'd you get started at this? I mean, you've got now. You've had this experience. You. What was the process of really getting to the point of where you've identified what you think is a scalable solution? Right. So I've been working, as you mentioned, I'm a serial entrepreneur, if you can call it that. Um, my previous company is also about using technology to solve social problems, and we do that more in a consulting mode with uh, other organizations, NGOs, governments, uh, and, and donor organizations. But while doing that work, I think what I realized was that in order to address this problem at the scale of the problem, if, it, if we are to reach a billion and a half people, the only way we were going to do that is by building a sustainable business model around it. Uh, it was not going to be through philanthropic money or uh, charity. So uh, what we ended up doing was we ended up staying in villages for about two months, um, living with the villagers, living uh, their lives, and really... Uh, trying to identify how people uh, address their health problems. Where do they go for care? Who do they trust? Uh, who do they pay money for getting care? And through that experience, we actually realized that there were entrepreneurs on the ground, like pharmacists in Bangladesh, who were already providing a degree of care. They handle 70% of the rural caseload in Bangladesh. Uh, and like the government uh, and the formal medical community, doctors uh, primarily, treat them as quacks and kind of completely discount them from the entire health system. But they are there and they're providing care. They care about the community. So we decided that these were the people that we needed to empower uh, with the right kind of technology so that they could provide much better quality care. And how many pharmacists are there? They, I mean, these, you keep saying these are pretty common and pretty available. How, how do you describe how available it is? Let's just say that within 15 minutes walk from your house, there is a pharmacy. Okay. Wow. That is the, that is the medical network then. Yeah. And so you figured out that you had to work with these pharmacists because they're the feet on the ground. They're the ones that are dealing with the medical issues because people are sick. One, you can't even walk the two hours to get to you know, the road network to even get to the city. So these are obviously going to be the front-line people. Mm -hmm. So, but in many cases, these, they, they're not trained medically. Mm -hmm. So how do you equip them in order to provide that medical care? 
So the model we have is uh, we give them a tablet which has algorithms that guide them through the process of gathering patient data. And once they gather uh, symptoms and, uh, and some basic examination results, they can send all of this information to the cloud where our doctors sitting hundreds of miles away can look at that information and can write a prescription. Uh, and they have a printer at the pharmacy which prints the prescription out within a few minutes. Okay. So in that case, then, you've basically have taken advantage of, you know, of the cloud technology, but now you've also put the doctor into the cloud. Absolutely. Amazing. And so, um, so now you've got this going in, in and started, and now you're in the process of scaling that out, right? Um, I would uh, say that we are we have in the we have been in the process of developing the service and really perfecting the service over the last uh, one year, and we are now at the stage where we know that the service works. We know that ninety percent of our patients go back really really satisfied with the service and even paying the two and a half dollars that they pay for the service. For the, for the it's two and a half dollars per visit. It's it's a two and a half dollars per wow. per visit um, plus the medicines. So, um, but. I think we're still a long way away from, so as we like to say it, our mission is to make healthcare as accessible as going to a Starbucks and as affordable as a cup of cappuccino. So that is a mission that we're a pretty uh, long distance away from, uh, but I think we're getting there. That's great. So if you want to follow what you're doing, how can they find you? So, uh, unfortunately, we've been too busy with developing the service, so we haven't had a website until now, and we're about to build it out. But uh, right now, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, Amader Doc. Uh, that's spelled A-M-A-D-E-R-D-O-C. Uh, Amader means uh, our doctor in Bangladesh, so that's... Great, and I'll put the links in it um, on the show notes, so you can go to killinnovations.com, and I'll have links to all the, the companies we're talking about. Um, you know, thanks for spending time with us. I don't know about you, but, you know, the fact that of rural care is uh, critically important. When we come back, I've got a killer question that's going to hack your brain. I'm Phil McKinney, and this is Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. BizTalk Radio. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. So here's the big question. Did you finish last week's homework? Let me remind you. The task was to come up with five ideas to make your product objectionable to some segments of the market. Now, I know that sounds strange, having people find you or your product or your idea objectionable, but it could be a great strategy to stand out. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go back and listen to last week's show, and then you can send in your homework. I am keeping score. So questions, as I've mentioned, are a mind hack. When you get asked a question, your brain cannot stop from answering it. So what is this week's mind hack? This week's mind hack is how can I eliminate customer hassles and create unique benefits for my customers? Now, this sounds obvious. We all want to reduce the hassles and create some form of unique benefit. But in many cases, we just look for that obvious hassle and look for that obvious benefit. And what you really want to do is to go beyond the obvious. Look beyond where all of your competitors and all the activities that they're doing and find something that is unique. So the... You know, when you think about your competitors, you know, when your competitors and you are all looking to, to reduce it or eliminate those hassles, there's, uh, there's this, again, this, this first choices, you're going to stop at the first answer or the first one that you find. But I want to give you an example, at least one for me from personally, right? I pretty much hate flying these days. You know, when I was at HP, I was doing 400, 500,000 miles a year um, in, a, in, a, in a plane. Um, even today, I still travel a lot. And let's face it, the travel is at best a neutral experience and at worst an absolutely awful experience. But that's probably not news to you. Um, the interesting idea is how customers have adapted to the ever, you know, this degrading experience of travel. Every new hassle flying is absorbed and becomes the new norm. 
to the point where people don't even complain about it anymore. You know, and who would have thought that the uh, that the public would have accepted um, more intense and you know pat downs and scannings and uh, background checks um, just to get onto an airplane? But the public has. Um, in fact, my wife, who is a nurse, absolutely abhorred the early scanning technologies because of her medical background and required that she had to be patted down each time. So uh, needless to say, that made travel um, with her even more interesting. The point is that customers are generally quick to accept a reduction in the pleasantness um, and the increases in the hassles, you know, especially when uh, the whole industry aligns around a certain approach. You know, when all of the airlines go to a new structure or a new technology, uh, they, you know, the, the public just pretty much resigns themselves. And this is not any different than in the, the airline industry, right? You know, low expectations and hassles are something that you can take advantage of because they're an opportunity to surprise and excite customers. If you can twist those hassles and make people pleased to get an experience that feels new and exciting or even just approximates the old standards of service, they will be absolutely ecstatic. Just acknowledging the reality of that downgraded experience instead of trying to pass it off as something done for your con convenience actually helps the customer truly understand and, and in some cases come to your side of the, the perspective. Now, one of my favorite airlines right now is Southwest, which is funny because you know, I'm guaranteed an economy seat on them rather than a business or a first class seat that I would get with an airline that I've traveled a lot on, right? So why do I like Southwest? They're pretty much perkless, right? There's no perks. Um, I shouldn't say that, right? Because I am a guaranteed A flyer on Southwest just because I fly it so much. But it's that minimal service. It's straightforward. It's easy to use. They don't overpromise. And as a result, they don't underdeliver. And to be quite honest, they've taken it upon themselves to actually try to bring some fun back into the airline process of boarding your planes, getting your seat. You know, they've made the they've made a big mark in, in the minds of their customers just by doing this how they do the safety message at the beginning of the flight. Right? Everybody else, you know, it doesn't matter what airline you're on, you can pretty much recite the safety message, right? They all say the exact same thing. My guess it's some standardized text that the FAA has approved, um, but not Southwest. They've taken it upon themselves to turn them into comedy routines. I've been on planes where the, uh, the head stewardess actually sang the entire safety uh, message. Um, the way they acted up, up and down the aisle can be funny on some of those planes. They're trying to actually poke fun at the fact that we've probably all listened to that message tens, hundreds, even thousands of times before. And in many cases, people have tuned it out. They don't even listen to the safety message. But when you get onto a Southwest flight and you've got a really fun crew, more people listen to the safety message than any other time on any other airline. And so not only do they make it fun, they actually get you to listen to the safety message, which is actually something that's really important. And this this piece about not over-promising, and therefore they don't under-deliver, it's missing that expectation. I have an expectation of a certain experience on an airline. You know, if I'm flying a legacy airline that I have a lot of miles on or privilege on, and I don't get a first-class upgrade, you'd be amazed at people who are standing at the counter, pounding the, the table, yelling at the, the counter people, boarding the plane as to why they should have gotten an upgrade. In this case, you know, on Southwest, you don't even have an expectation for an upgrade. So, so again, no hassles, no headache. I think that's a great example. So sparking points, what hassles would I need to overcome for my customer in order to leapfrog over your competitor's products? What would you need to do differently, and how would your competitors respond to the changes? So your assignment this week, identify five customer hassles that you can identify, and then for each hassle, come up with five ideas to overcome them. So 25 ideas that eliminate customer hassles that you can use to disrupt the, com the competition. Why five? It's what I call an idea quota. Just like you go to the gym and you do your exercise sets, the idea quota is your creative muscle exercise set. So just don't stand there. Don't dodge it. Get out there and do it. Share your homework by sending it to me at phil at killinnovations.com, and I'll share the best ideas on the show. If you mark it private, I won't share it on the show, but I will reply to you with my thoughts on your ideas. And don't think you only have one week. If you're listening to this later, uh, feel free to go ahead and send that in. So 
Um, hopefully this show today with the Unreasonable Institute is something that inspired you. Uh, and uh, we uh, will be bringing more of these to you between the shows. Make sure you check out com. It's a place where you can plug in. Also, don't miss out on the other great shows on the BizTalk Radio Network at biztalkradio.com. While you're there, grab the mobile app, and you can listen to Kill Innovations and all the shows live. And uh, if you know of a great innovator out there, get them, uh, give me their name, and we'll get them on the show at phil at killinnovations.com. Today's show was engineered by Reagan, who has the difficult task of keeping me on track. I'm Phil McKinney, and you've been listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Thanks for listening. The opinions you hear on Biz Talk Radio are those of the hosts, callers, and guests, and do not necessarily reflect those of this station, Biz Talk Radio, its management, or advertisers. The information on Biz Talk Radio does not constitute a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or service. If you have any questions about Biz Talk Radio, contact us at 817 274 1609 or at biztalkradio.com. Biz Talk Radio. 